So my second tarot guide book is Cosmic Tarot by, I think, G I'm going to call her Jean Hewitts because she is a woman and she lives in America. I thought this was a French man for the longest time. I've seen the name before um, and I just didn't do really any investigation until I started reading this book. And then I went, oh, I'm wrong about that person. Um, so yeah, she, uh, she, it's interesting. This book has a little sort of autobiography in the first, um, the first couple of pages about how she met Stuart Kaplan while working at Wiser Books when they were in New York City on Broadway. And then she became an editor for Stuart at uh, US Games for a number of years and, you know, wrote books on tarot and, um, helped uh, bring in artists and, you know, develop concepts for tarot decks that they were going to publish and all this. Um, so it's fascinating. And I'll link to her uh, personal website below. She's still alive. And she's written a bunch of other stuff. She's written fiction. She's written essays. Um, she's edited books. So uh, yeah, she's a fascinating human being. Um, this book is interesting because Jean Hewitts is not the artist, the concept uh, designer for the Cosmic Tarot. Um, that go that uh, accolade goes to uh, a man from Germany called Norbert Loesch. So he came up with the design for the Cosmic Tarot originally in the 80s, and then this book book was not developed uh, until the 90s. So about a dozen years later, um, after that was published, and I don't know if she talked to him about his approach to tarot, his philosophy, you know, what he intended or what, you know, how he picked the designs for his cards. Um, if you're not familiar with this deck, I have featured it on my channel a couple of times. Uh, it's very different. It uses um, portraits, essentially, of, of figures. And um, some of them are based on famous people. So you'll, um, you know, open, up, open it up and you're like, oh, that's, that looks like Sean Connery. Um, and that's because... It is based on Sean Connery's face. Not all of them are recognizable, but a number of them are. And um, so I think that throws some people off. I don't mind it. I actually th kind of think it's cool and quirky, um, but it's an interesting feature of the deck. And then as you can see, a lot of these are um, illustrated in ways that are very different from the RWS. There's a lot of dance, a lot of movement, a lot of, like I said, movie stars, um, so it's very theatrical, and it's it's really interesting. The cards themselves are in color, full color, and they're sort of a, a saturated pastel, sort of a lot of jewel tones and, and uh, saturated pastel colors. And I really like the artwork, and that's why I originally bought it. And then I got a little bit curious about kind of the foundations of the deck, and so I ordered this book separately. Again, this is out of print, uh, originally published by US Games, and it cost $10. So please don't overpay for this. Be patient, look on the used book sites, you should be able to get a copy for under 20, I would think. Um, I can't remember how much I paid for mine, but um, it shouldn't be expensive. This book, while it does have a Fool's Dog app, it is not complete. The app does not have the full text of the book. And the app just has the keywords um, it has a little bit of a, like an introduction and then it just has the keywords for each of the cards. So I would say get the app if you're looking, if you want to look at the cards, it does have all the cards images in it. That's a nice feature and it's again less expensive than buying the deck. But if you're interested in the book, don't bother with the app, just try to find a copy of the book. Um, the deck itself is still in print from US Games and it does come with a small booklet, but it's not the full the full text as we see here. So this is, it's kind of a new agey book. It's a little problematic in places because it does things like talk about opposites and then it's like opposite races, you know, like black people are the opposite of white people is sort of one of the things that insinuates. And I'm like, mm, no, 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 no. Let's not go down this road. But it's not sinister about it. Um, I, just I just think it's, it's clunky and again, outdated. Um, what's interesting about it is that for each of the majors, you get several different sections. So it kind of goes from macrocosm to microcosm. So the sections are the cosmos. So you start with the universe, essentially. Then you talk about the human community. And then it talks about the individual. And then she gives you a list of meanings. And she acknowledges that the meanings are kind of all over the place. 
which is interesting. It's more than A.E. Waite does in his book, where the meanings are all over the place. If you read the pictorial key, he gives you like this random smattering of keywords. But she really emphasizes that cards can have vastly different meanings depending on the context. She talks about how, you know, the question is important, the other cards in the reading are important. So she kind of um, hits some of these, these goalposts, if you will, that I really find important. She has a very loose, wishy-washy <laughs> kind of introduction to the history of tarot in here that's not accurate. So yeah, so it's it's like this mix of really insightful and then really kind of like what <laughs> um, stuff. She says, uh, occultists use the tarot for predictions in ritual and as flashcards for whatever system, Kabbalistic, alchemical, quasi-Christian, they might wish to study. And that is the first time I've seen anyone in writing acknowledge that some people use tarot cards as if they are flashcards. Um, and I just was like, yes, yes, thank you. Um, I personally find that to be a terrible way to read. I think if you're just going to memorize a bunch of meanings and use them as flashcards, then you could get a better reading from a computer. <laughs> or, or just as good of a reading from a computer as you could from a human being who might forget what, what keyword goes with what card. But I do think the flashcard thing can be useful in other ways, like, like learning other systems or... You know, maybe you have very specific associations with very specific cards for like ritualistic purposes or something. I'm, I'm not denigrating that. But just to hear someone kind of say that out loud was like, aha, <laughs> I got you. <laughs> I see what you did there. She also says, uh, the predicting is the most ridiculed aspect of tarot. The randomness of a tarot reading focuses on the imagination, forces the imagination to look at alternatives to see things from a different perspective. Having absorbed the traditions, you personalize them by understanding the cards through context, considering the question asked or the situation. So I'm like, yay. And then she goes on to say, it is beside the point, except in historical purposes, to shoot down the occult myth that has grown up around the tarot. Obviously, ancient Egyptians had nothing to do with creating tarot. Now, I find that interesting, right? Because she's like, you know, don't disparage the occultists and the esotericists for their made up wacky history that doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, let them have it. And I'm kind of like, why is that appealing? Why is why is fake history appealing to anybody? I don't understand. But but she does say that, you know, the Egyptians had nothing to do with tarot. And again, of the people who are writing in the in the, you know, I'd say 70s through 90s, nobody seems to acknowledge that openly. Like this is made up. It didn't really happen. So she rubs me the wrong way and then she says something brilliant. It's it's a really funny book and I, I really enjoyed reading it. I, if you'll indulge me, I'm gonna read you an entry from this book because it's kind of cool. Like not all the entries are great. Some of them are a little problematic, um, but the one for the Wheel of Fortune really struck me as pretty neat. So this will give you a flavor of Cosmic Terror. Here we go. Number 10, the Wheel of Fortune. So she starts with the description of the card. A network of circles, squares, and triangles turns the cosmos. The symbolic design represents clockworks. The Wheel of Fortune is one of three cards in the major arcana that does not show a human figure. The, two, the other two are death and the moon. Hence, the wheel does not generally point to a person or type of person. The cosmos. The magical mechanism of our solar system is diagrammed in the Wheel of Fortune. The center holds the sun from which radiate like petals of a flower the cosmic bodies known to the ancients. Uh, Saturn, Jupiter, Venus, Moon, Mercury, and Mars. Next comes the Zodiac. Uh, at the top, immediately outside the Zodiac, are Neptune and Uranus. And above these, in the center, is Pluto. The four corners hold the four elements. Water, air, earth, and fire. The bottom central orb is a symbol of the unity of the four elements and also the planet Earth. Together, the yellow orbs of the planets form the diagram of the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. Hebrew word near Pluto at the top reads Kether, um, blah, 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 Kabbalistic stuff. Okay. The, Kab the Kabbalah, a system of esoteric teachings rooted in Judaism, is a beautiful and glorious study, whether one is Jewish, Muslim, or Christian, or even if one follows an Eastern path. It illuminates any religion or philosophy, as well as exalting our intellect, emotions, and senses. In a sense, the Kabbalah is like, a, is like the tantric systems of Hinduism and Buddhism, and a trustworthy teacher is the first thing a would-be student should seek. Trustworthy teacher. Like, don't just go out there and make up shit and, and you know, co-opt this for your own 
uh, purposes. <coughs> Wait, <coughs> Crowley. Um, yeah. Uh, like Tantra, the study does have a safeguard. It's, its real secrets can be passed on only by direct transmission, living teacher to living student. The name Kabbalah, after all, is from Hebrew, the Hebrew word kwabal, to receive. Right? You can't receive something that hasn't been given to you. Uh, I just love it. And then she talks about the human community. So this is the second section. For centuries, the Wheel of Fortune was illustrated with a medieval image. A wheel to which are bound four kings is turned by the blindfolded goddess of fortune. The king at the top of the wheel blithely says, I reign. The king at the bottom bears the wheel on his back and says, I am without reign. One king ascends hopefully, I will reign. Another king descends, I have reigned. The age of reason took a less fatalistic view of government. Humanity would evolve o over time, a society of justice, love, and material abundance. The United States was formed partly on such an ideal. This utopia is a variation on the medieval Christian city of God, with trust moved from God to the God-given human, human qualities of reason and compassion. The medieval wheel of fortune seems to deny that humankind has any control over its destiny. It dictates that the rise and fall of nations is an inexorable cycle to which all are helplessly bound. We are indeed bound by circumstances of history and nature, but women and, men and women possess the means to better society. Utopian visions can nurture the quest, even if lack of insight of ourselves and the world around us provides a sense that the blind goddess rules our fortunes. Social evolution is a trial and error process. We must learn from our triumphs and from our errors. At the individual level, the Wheel of Fortune can indicate an ecstatic experience of oneness with the universe and a breakthrough in understanding natural law. Spiritual life is integrated with worldly activities. Realization of the impermanent nature of things can bring comfort or can cause great sadness. As well, the Wheel can indicate a healing of body and mind. One can feel that one is, again, behind the Wheel, in control. Conversely, the Wheel may show stagnation, which can take the form of bad luck, or a sense of being manipulated by circumstances. Keywords, realization of the cosmic order, application of higher laws, dance of energies, healing, constant changes, fortune, turning point, as above, so below, good or bad luck, depending on other influences, inevitability, lack of control. So I just find this all fascinating. I really do. Um, and uh, yeah, and her entry for the world is really cool uh, in comparison, in contrast to this thing for the wheel. I won't read it because she talks about dance, dance, sacred dance, uh, religious dance, ecstatic dance. You know, it's it's very cool. And that sense of wholeness and completion comes back around from the wheel to the to the world. Um, so yeah, so I don't know. Would I recommend this book? Um, oh, I did want to say uh, the the. Pip cards, um, the minor arcana, do not get such lengthy descriptions. They get uh, very lengthy vi uh, verbal descriptions, like this and this and this and this are in the card, and then you just get a chunk of keywords at the end. So they're not quite as um, thought-provoking and sort of ecstasy-making as her writing on the majors, but say la vie. So would I recommend this deck, or this, this book? I'd recommend the deck, absolutely, if, if the artwork appeals to you. I think it's really cool. Uh, it gets away from a lot of the stereotypical RWS imagery, if you're tired of looking at that. Would I recommend the book? Mm -hmm. With those caveats I mentioned, yes. Is this going to be for everybody? No. So, but I think if, you know, if that excerpt kind of intrigued you or whatever, um, or if you, if you appreciated her writing, then yeah, I think it could be a cool, a cool thing to read. So, there you go.